Welcome back, and thank you very much for keeping the time. I hope you enjoyed nice coffee, tea, and chats. So now we are entering the theme two of the conference. It's about the inclusion of Ukrainian refugee students in the host countries. But now you might, some of you might have noticed the difference in this room. There are two ladies standing there in the middle of the room. They are Katka and Adela from the visual coach. They are going to help us to create, they create, <laughs> the visual representation or the visual image of the discussion and key points and highlights, which will help us to reflect upon what we have heard, what we have discussed, and what we could remember after this conference. So thank you very much in advance. We are going to enjoy your products later. So without further ado, I'd like to give a microphone over to my colleague, Andrea Naleto, who is from uh, UNICEF uh, Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia, based in Budapest. And he's supporting us and all the other country offices and refugee response offices in Europe for this crisis. So Andrea, over to you. Thank you, Aki. Ladies and gentlemen, panelists, guests, welcome to the session, Language Acquisition for Learning. I am Andrea Naletto, honored to serve as a moderator. Representing UNICEF uh, Europe and Central Asia Regional Office, I emphasize our commitment to inclusive, equitable, and quality education for all refugee children in Europe. Achieving proficiency in the language of instruction is essential for their successful integration into schools and society at large. These afternoon discussions have highlighted a significant challenge. While many Ukrainian refugee children have successfully integrated into their European host country educational system, a notable proportion have not. According to the OECD, 63% of countries identify language as the key barrier to enrolling Ukrainian refugee children, a view also supported by UNICEF, which consistently emphasized language as a critical barrier to their integration into local schools. In 2023, last year, UNICEF surveyed Ukrainian refugee language programs in the Visegrad group countries. Despite their proximity to Ukraine and the shared Slavic linguistic tradition, Hungary excluded, these countries have faced challenges not only for the massive number of refugee children to integrate into local schools, but also for their limited experience in refugee education. Nevertheless, we have identified several promising practices, initiatives, and opportunities. These countries promptly implemented language learning initiatives ranging from separate preparatory classes to direct integration models, all aimed at easing the transition to a new language and educational systems. Combined with learning support, extracurricular activities, parental engagement, and comprehensive teacher training, these measures have been crucial in facilitating not only the academic, but also the cultural integration. Moreover, since over 70% of the Ukrainian adult refugees hold higher education degrees, and about 15% of them have previous experience in the education sector in Ukraine, it is vital to acknowledge the pivotal role these refugee educators play in school integration and language learning, frequently serving as teaching assistants or other instructional or no instructional capacities these multilingual individuals have been instrumental in facilitating the educational journey of fellow refugees while supporting the overstretched education system in those countries. Now, let me share a story that captures the core of today's discussion. Last October, I visited a UNICEF-supported education center in Bucharest, Romania, where I encountered Ukrainian teenagers who were skeptical about the benefits of learning Romanian for the future. One young man, 
aspiring to study industrial design in Barcelona, in Spain, initially doubted the utility of Romanian language. However, he revisited his opinion upon realizing that learning Romanian language could facilitate the acquisition of other Romance languages, including Spanish. That insight, gained through my visits to various refugee hosting countries in the region, highlights the importance of motivation and envisioning future opportunities in overcoming language barriers for these youth. Today, we are honored to host a panel of distinguished experts. Halkas Molova Zavarova of the National Pedagogical Institute of the Czech Republic will explore Ukrainian refugee language learning in the country. Speaker Kamila Dembinska from the SOC Foundation in Poland will discuss their assistance to Polish educators. Professor Judith Ollenweger Haskell from Zurich University of Teacher Education will discuss Switzerland's multicultural multilingual refugee and migrant integration solutions. And finally, our discussant sitting with you in the audience, Oksana Demchenko, a Ukrainian teacher in, in Czech Republic, will share her experience in supporting the language integration of Ukrainian refugee children. Even though this 50-minute session cannot cover every aspect of second language acquisition for Ukrainian children, it enables us to delve into the challenges these children encounter in a new linguistic settings and consider innovative solutions for language acquisition that foster inclusion. So, in the, let me quote Noam Chomsky, which you may know is one of the most prominent linguist, linguistic, uh, American linguistic in the world, whose father had Ukrainian origins. He was born in modern day Ukraine. Chomsky says that language is not just words, it's a culture, a tradition, a unification of a community, a whole history that creates what a community is. It's all embodied in the language. Language, education, and inclusion are interconnected. And this quote captures our discussion perfectly. Let us make this session a catalyst for action, encouraging us to engage, inquire, and collaborate on language learning and integration solutions for refugees. Let me now turn to our first guest, Halka Smolova Zavarova, the National Pedagogical Institute of the Czech Republic, to ask you if you could walk us through the programs that MPI has implemented in the Czech Republic to support the language acquisition for Ukrainian refugees, in particular the work you did with the educators. Over to you. <coughs> Please use the microphone. Thank you. Já si dovolím teda mluvit česky. Už se tady na začátku vlastně stalo to, že anglicky rozumím, umím, ale když potřebujeme mluvit o práci, tak potřebuju překladatele, takže jsem si doběhla ještě pro překladatele a přesně jsem si uvědomila, jak je pro děti těžké se soustředit tak dlouho v cizím jazykovém prostředí na jazyk, kterým nemluví. To znamená, chvíl, chvilku dávají pozor a na, za chvíli jim mozek vypadá, a e, vlastně mají problém potom s tím pochopit, co po nich třeba pedagogové chtějí a tak. Takže přesně e, zkušenost vždycky je dobrá na to, aby člověk potom vymýšlel, jak těm dětem pomoct právě z, té, z tohoto úhlu pohledu. E, děkuji za tu otázku na Národní pedagogický institut. Národní pedagogický institut je vlastně e, organizace, která je zřízená ministerstvem školství a podporuje vlastně veškeré, veškeré věci, které ministerstvo školství zavádí a v praxi je podporuje. My podporujeme pedagogické pracovníky, takže podporujeme pedagogické pracovníky, kteří pracují s dětmi a žáky cizinci. To znamená, že ve chvíli, kdy nastala agrese vůči ukrajinskému území Ruská, tak se v České republice začaly objevovat postupně rodiny, maminky s dětmi, které se během jednoho týdne vlastně některé objevily ve školách a pedagogové a pedagožky byly 
postaveni před úlohu, jak s těmi dětmi zacházet, jak jim pomoct, jak je vlastně přivítat v české škole, jak tu českou školu udělat tak, aby se tam cítili dobře a zároveň, jak začít podporovat ten český jazyk, který je základním integračním kamenem. Národní pedagogický institut od začátku vlastně poskytoval dvě služby, bylo to, byly to překladatelské služby, takže my jsme hned v prvních dnech, kdy, se, kdy ta krize nastala, jsme do škol posílali tlumočníky, kteří pomáhali školám a rodinám pochopit, co se děje, domlouvat se na tom, jaké budou další kroky, co děti potřebují, z jaké přišly situace, aby vlastně ti učitelé věděli. Zároveň jsme poskytovali první tři měsíce finanční prostředky na adaptační koordinátory, což byla taková služba, která pomáhala zaplatit člověka, který se těm dětem v té škole věnuje, když přijdou nově. To znamená, že ve chvíli, kdy ten systém ještě se musel vzpamatovat, tak Národní pedagogický institut tohle nabízel a my jsme takhle za tři měsíce podpořili zhruba tři tisíce dětí, které přišly nově a e, mohli jsme rovnou k ním poslat člověka, kterým pomůže se s tím začátkem začlenování. V další fázi potom jsme nabízeli intenziv vzdělávání pro pedagogy a to v, jak v oblastech jak integrace, tak vlastně v oblastech jak učit češtinu jako druhý jazyk. Protože mm, pedagogové, čeští pedagogové jsou speciální v tom, že mají hodně didaktiky a ve chvíli, kdy jim pomáháte s tím, jak vlastně pojmout učení češtiny jako druhého jazyka, tak pro tu krizovou situaci jsou velmi flexibilní a velmi dobře se vlastně chytli v tom, jak a co dělat. Takže my jsme se snažili vlastně podpořit ty pedagogy, kteří mohli začít vyučovat češtinu jako druhý jazyk. Natočili jsme krátká videa i pro dobrovolníky, kteří třeba vyučovali český jazyk v adaptačních skupinách, kde vlastně bylo potřeba od začátku vykládat, jak učit jednotlivé pozdravy, jakým způsobem přistupovat k dětem, takže i to je k dispozici a vlastně je to k dispozici pořád. A pak jsme samozřejmě pokračovali vývojem dalších vzdělávacích programů, které se v současné době hodně... <laughs> Mě tam nabíhá ta angličtina, já se omlouvám. Které se soustředují hodně na začlenování dětí do heterogenního kolektivu. To znamená, že my ta základní fáze adaptace proběhla, ale ty děti v tuhle chvíli budou potřebovat další podporu, jak v češtině, tak začlenování do těch, v té akademické češtině, protože tam vlastně jde o ten úspěch vzdělávací a ten je potřeba zajistit i podporou té akademické češtiny, a tu už budou částečně moc dělat i pedagogové, kteří nebudou učit jenom češtinu, ale budou učit jednotlivé své předměty, ale budou vědět, jak ten předmět učit tak, aby i žák s nedostatečnou znalostí vlastně toho jazyka mohl se vzdělávat v té, v té třídě a měl co největší zisk z, té, z toho procesu. Thank you so much. Thanks for the comprehensive overview. Uh, If we are able, as panelists, to keep it a bit shorter, then we can have um, uh, additional Sorry. rounds of questions. But there is so much to tell, right? That yes. is impossible to co condense uh, shorter time. answers. But let us, let us now move to Poland, right? A country that has, uh, has hosted the highest number of refugees nominally, as opposed to Czech Republic uh, with the highest number of refugees per capita. And I'm glad to, uh, to be talking to you, Camila, because I know you have a, a teaching background, linguistic background, and you are the language program director for the SOC Foundation. I'm also very happy to bring to the panel the civil society, the voice of the, uh, the CBOs and NGOs, which has been mentioned as a critical actor this morning. So Camila, can you walk us through the program that the SOC Foundation implemented in Poland to train Polish educators to be better prepared to teach Polish as a second language to the many Ukrainian kids in schools. 
Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation for this conference. It's very important for us as a SOC Foundation to, um, to share our experience and, uh, and I'm glad to, and I'm honored to, to be here. Um, and uh, we are happy and proud to be implementing partner of UNICEF in Poland. And we are sure that uh, all together uh, we, uh, we are uh, trying our best to, uh, to let Ukrainian refugee children better, uh, to be better integrated into Polish educational system. So briefly, uh, what is the mission uh, of uh, SOC Foundation? It's, uh, we've been always supporting children from the very beginning, so from 2018. Uh, children from foster care. Uh, we try to support them in becoming strong and independent. So just after the beginning of the full-scale war, uh, the inv invasion in, uh, in Ukraine, we focused on Ukraine, Ukrainian refugee children in Poland. And what was the biggest need for them? That was the language, because in April, our Ministry of Education opened uh, the Polish educational system to refugee children. So the language and, of course, the emotional regulation and stress reduction. So we were wondering in June 2022, how can we help children? And SOC Foundation is such an organization that loves to scale uh, their operations and activities. So we were asking, of course, we can organize a language summer camp for 100 uh, children or 150. But then we, we thought, who is the closest to refugee children in Polish school? Teachers. Who should be able to support them in the language acquisition and, and stress regulation? <coughs> should be teachers. So that's why we decided to organize, basing on, on our expertise, I'm a Polish language teacher and teacher trainer uh, more than 20 years, so we decided to uh, offer and to program teachers training uh, in both areas, how to teach Polish and how to uh, support children in dealing with trauma. And we started in uh, July 2022. It was an online emergency program, so two week intensive courses. And during 15, 15 editions, uh, we had more than 3,500 teachers that took part in our, in our training. And what was important, we tried, it, it was very practical approach. We wanted to help them support Ukrainian children as, as soon as possible. And what was really important it was this MHPSS component. That was something innovative at that time. It, it seems it's still something uh, not common to put together glottodidactic, so how to teach Polish as a second language, and this trauma reduction. That was our idea, and uh, it lasted one and a half year. And so we know that it was really, really important, this support for teachers from Poland and also Ukrainian teachers. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Camila. And now we turn to Professor Judith, who brings the distinct experience which we, look, we all look up to of the Swiss uh, landscape and context. So, Professor, could you give us a, an overview of uh, how the Swiss teach language to migrants and refugees, including Ukrainian refugees? Yeah, good afternoon, and thanks for this opportunity to speak here to you. Uh, unlike uh, the countries around the Czech Republic, uh, Switzerland has had many years of experience. We had a huge influx of uh, refugees in, after the uh, wars in the Balkans. 
So uh, at that time, uh, we actually learned how to manage with uh, a lot of refugee children uh, coming uh, to Switzerland. Uh, they're very quickly distributed uh, to the communities and registered there with the schools. So they go to the school from the first day on. Each school has a slightly uh, different approach. We are a very decentralized education system, so there is no unified approach, which makes it easier to be responsive to the specific situation. Uh, due to the long uh, experience, we have a well-established uh, system and professionals in each school who know how to teach German or French or Italian as a second language. And uh, children have the right, so they don't need to be assessed uh, for their language skill, they have the right to receive these uh, lessons. We also provide uh, translation services, especially for the parents, for um, communication. And um, so this is more the individual approach, uh, but uh, I think even more powerful is the school-based approach. So we have this program called uh, Quality in Multicultural Schools, where schools that have more than 40% of children who don't speak German or who are of foreign uh, nationalities, they receive additional uh, funds uh, to approach their linguistic, social and um, yeah, performance issues uh, as a school and not individually for the child. And this has proven to be very successful and it was actually exported to many other countries in Europe. Wonderful, thank you. We look forward to hearing a bit more about that model in the next round of questions. But now I will bring, I put back my headset because I'm going to be asking Halka another question. And just before coming to the panel, Halka was briefing me saying that there's, there's been a, tr a significant learning thanks to the refugee uh, crisis, the Ukraine refugee crisis, significant learning that can benefit other migrant groups and language groups in the country. So could you please elaborate a bit on that? What has the crisis taught your institute, but in general, uh, the Czech sort of system, to better respond, better include all children, thanks to specific and tailored language learning programs? Thank you. Budu věnovat tomu, co vlastně nám ta krize přinesla a co jsme mohli, co jsme se naučili. Je to tak, že Česká republika má od roku 2021 legislativně stanovený nárok na podporu žáků, cizinců, kteří přicházejí do českého vzdělávacího systému a ta podpora je legislativně zakotvená, což je základní věc, která je velmi důležitá. A říkám to proto, že to, co vlastně nás ukrajinská Zkušenost naučila je, že když máme ten systém, který má nějaká, nějaké vstupy, tak ty vstupy, když už je systém, tak, ho, tak je můžeme upravovat. Ty vstupy tím, že se Česká republika měla zavedený systém podpory, jazykové podpory eh, nově příchozích dětí, tak, my, tak ministerstvo, vni, ministerstvo školství pardon, eh, vlastně eh, mohlo pracovat s tím, že má eh, síť škol, které jsou určené a ve kterých probíhá vzdělávání jazykové a mohlo navyšovat finanční prostředky, které do toho systému jdou, což udělalo měnit parametry těch skupin, měnit parametry toho, jak která škola je pověřená tím učit. A to vlastně vedlo k tomu, že se podařilo poměrně masivně ta první adaptační fáze zvládnout, protože ten systém už byl nějakým způsobem zač počátečně nastavený a dal se modifikovat. Takže to si myslím, že je důležité a důležité mi připadá i to, že vlastně pro tu modifikaci toho systému jsme se naučili nebo je vidět, že pokud se ten systém nastaví šířeji, to znamená méně dětí ve skupině, 
a větší dostupnost, to znamená víc pověřených škol, což se v tuhle chvíli dělo, takže se do toho systému dostanou nejenom ukrajinské děti, ale že všechny děti, které jsou cizinci, se vlastně lépe dostanou k té jazykové podpoře, k, tomu první, k té první podpoře toho jazyka ve chvíli, kdy přicházejí do českého školství do českého vzdělávacího systému a je potřeba říct, že v Čechách je povinná školní docházka. To znamená, že všechny děti, které se po, po, zdržují na území déle jak 90 dní, musí se účastnit povinné školní docházky. To znamená, že nejde, aby to dítě se třeba půl roku učilo jazyk a pak teprve nastoupilo do školy. Ono musí nastoupit do školy a tím pádem ty pověřené školy, které jsou, tak je potom mohou podporovat v češtině. Je otázkou, jak do budoucna bude ten systém masivní, jak kolik hodin budou mít, na kolik hodin budou mít ty děti nárok, ale už je to všechno o těch parametrech, které se dají diskutovat a které budou záležet na té veřejné diskuzi, jak se nastaví. A to si myslím, že je hlavní benefit toho, co se dělo, protože za mě, musím to tady říct, ta udržitelnost vlastně těch opatření, které se nastavovaly nejenom pro Ukrajinu, je strašně důležitá i pro zbytek dětí, které přicházejí do našeho vzdělávacího systému. A stejně jako ukrajinské děti si nevybrali to, že sem chtějí přijít, stejně jako ukrajinské děti doma nechali své kamarády a musí si najít v České republice nové kamarády. A proto mi přijde důležité, že i oni dostanou vlastně ten benefit toho, že se dostanou k té jazykové podpoře a budou mít větší šanci se potom zapojit do vzdělávání. Druhá věc, která ještě teda, už jsem zase dlouhá, je určitě rozšíření povědomí o tom, co potřebují děti cizinci a o tom, to téma přinést vlastně do povědomí pedagogů a pedagožek. A to mi přijde taky velmi důležité a Poslední věc, kterou bych tomu chtěla říct. V českém školství jsem za tu dobu potkala strašně moc velmi uh, lidí, kteří jsou vtaženi do té problematiky, kter na kterých je vidět, že chtějí pomáhat, chtějí ty pro děti lepší školu a myslí to dobře. A to mně připadá jako strašně důležitý benefit a pozitivní nastavení do budoucna pro české školství. Hau, domluvil jsem. Thank you, Halka. Let me turn to Camila once again. Camila, I'm very intrigued by the um, teacher training program you were describing with uh, um, teaching uh, Polish to foreign kids, as well as the stress regulation of mental health. Could you elaborate a bit on, on, on that uh, uh, synergetic impact of the two elements? <clears throat> yes, of course. Um, I think we should start with the challenge that uh, all teachers had in front of them. Uh, nobody were, were, was prepared for this, um, for this task of teaching Polish. Nobody was prepared for uh, this need of support in stress reduction. Um, And, and of course, um, we are convinced that the, this first aid might be delivered not only by specialists, so people with like five years of studies. We wanted to give these basic tools for teachers to just enable them to start helping as soon as possible. So, um, and one uh, more uh, comment on, there's this uh, stereotype, or even I would call it a myth of proximity of Slavic languages, which from one hand, it's true, we can communicate, I can understand you, <laughs> but uh, when it comes to, to the um, real uh, important matters, like for example, school education, It's not enough. And uh, children uh, were facing and still uh, are facing this challenge and problem in understanding and fully um, uh, taking part in this education system. That's why, um, that's why we, uh, we 
decided to, to give this tool to, to the teachers how to teach Polish. And then this MHPSS, so mental health and psychosocial support um, tools, uh, it was needed, of course we wanted, and we thought about how to, once again, how to save children and how to help them. But soon it turned out that it was very important for teachers, for those who uh, were struggling with their emotions, who were uh, really putting a big effort in, in supporting children without the knowledge how to do this. So um, we were sure that this um, program of combining those two elements, that was a crucial uh, and very good decision. And I think it, uh, it's, um, it goes hand to hand with uh, conflict sensitive education, so to identify well the real need. Um, and that was the need of, of teachers at that time. Thank you, Camilla. Before I go to Professor Judith, I would like to invite a special person in the audience, uh, that is to say, Oksana Demchenko, a Ukrainian educator, a teaching assistant in primary school, Prague 9. Thanks for being with us today and bringing the voice of the practitioners. We've been talking a lot about educators and the contribution of Ukrainian educators particularly in the Czech Republic, but also in many other countries in the region, including Poland. Could you quickly walk us through the challenges you encountered in the classroom about teaching Czech to uh, fellow Ukrainian uh, refugees' children, and uh, any lessons learned or suggestions you may have based on your experience? Dobrý den. Děkuji vám. Chtěla bych na začátku srdečně poděkovat. Dobře, děkuji. Srdečně poděkovat České republice a ostatním státům za pomoc a podporu ukrajinským uprchlikům. Uprchlikám. Pro nás je to byla opravdu otázka pro život a moc moc vám všem děkuji. Každé dítě musí chodit do školy, musí mít tu možnost jít do školy. Tak díky Česko, moje děti, moje vlastní děti, taky můžou chodit do školy. A taky jsem, jsem učitelka z Ukrajiny a mám možnost pracovat ve svém oboru. A pracuji ve škole jako asistentka pedagoga. Proto taky chci moc vám poděkovat. A či, co jsem potkávám každý den? Teď už vím z různých stran, kvůli zkušenosti jak matka, jako matka ukrajinských dětí a jako a, asistent pedagoga, jako a, pedagogický pracovník, rozumím, že adaptace je to velmi náročný i dlouhý proces. V tento roce ještě nemůžou být děti úplně adaptovaní pro české prostředí a, po, a cítit si dobře. A taky může vidět, že někdo mluví moc hezky a někdo mluví z potíže, dělají dělaj chyby, dělaj, mají hodně problémů. Tak a vidím už, jaký kroky a měly od začátku úspěv a, če, a co a strašně chybí v českém školství. A z čeho začít? Z toho, co chybí Ně, něco? Nebo a z toho skvělého? Jak chcete? Ze skvělého. Dobře, co bylo dobře? Bylo dobře, t- bylo dobře, moc dobře to, a co děti mohly hned okamžitě nastupit do školy i bez znalosti, jakýkoliv znalosti českého jazyka. Taky a skvělým byl variant takový, a když děti má, mají své třídy, ale své třídu potkává jenom o přestavce a ostatní čas tráví s asistentem pedagoga, který je učí. Učí prostě úplně všemu. Učí jak českému, jako druhému jazyku. Po, vysvětluje, vyjadruje, co to je. A učí mluvit, učí pozdravit, učí si chovat. Všechno, všechno probírá, protože a každý z nás má své zkušenosti. I občas to, co patří k nějakému prostředí, úplně nepatří do jiného prostředí. 
A to taky musí vysvětlit škola dítě. A potom za nějaký čas, za dva, za tři měsíci dítě potřebuje, anebo má možnost, už zastupí do a, třídy jako normální žák. Může komunikovat, může rozumět paní učitelku. A pro mě takovou, takovým znakem, že dítě je adaptované nebo adaptace pokračuje dobře, a je to to, že dítě má své kamarády, s kterými mluví česky. A když už to se začíná být, nebo když to už začíná být, tak to znamená, že dítě adaptace, adaptace má skvělou. Ale adaptace se nekončí, podporu stále potřebuje, ale už máme nějaký pokrok. Taky moc užitečné, když podpora českého jako druhého jazyka takových lekce, dítě má poržat, i když už mluví hezky, ať má ty hodiny, protože moc užitečný, nejenom tím, že tam a, něco se učí českého, a tam ještě potkává i nich, a, ostatních Ukrajinců z této školy a může mít takový nějaký ukrajinský klap a, a v nějakém takovém prostředí so, a, zvláštním, tam, kde netrápí a, ukrajinčinou české děti, ostatní děti nebo české učitelky, může mluvit v rodním jazyce, může a, taky jako vyjadřit své myšlenky a tak dále. Taky moc důležité přítomnost nějakého ukrajinského dospělého ve škole, ať to bude asistent pedagoga, anebo může nějaká ukrajinská učitelka. Kvůli tomu, že jsem taky uprchlík, já hezky rozumím ty děti, rozumím takové věci, které dřív jsem nerozuměla, odpovídám na takové otázky, které může ostatní lidi prostě nemohli by, nedokázali by odpovědět. A opravdu poskytuju, můžu tak říct, že poskytuju tu psychologickou pomoc a podporu našim dětem. A je to pro nich moc důležité. A ještě. Co taky je důležité? A každ, kož, každá adaptace má nebo musí mít cíl. Pokud není cíl, tak adaptace nebude pokračovat. Už jsem dneska slyšela o duálním takovém a, názoru. A, musí být a, dvě kategorie, dvě kategorie uprchlíků z Ukrajiny, ti, kteří například určitě se vrátí domů za pár týdnů nebo pár měsíců a ti, který domů může i nevrátit z nějakého důvodu. A je to takový mm, jako sporný názor, ale podle mě a, musím takový otázky pokladat, protože adaptace dítě se začíná z rodiny. I pokud a, rodiče začínají rozumět a sami sebě odpovídají na otázku, budeme se zůstávat v českém prostředí, musím si začlenovat jako moha dřív a jako moha líp, anebo ne. Pokud takové otázky necháme bez odpovědí, tak adaptace podle mě pokračovat, fungovat tak skvěle, jako mohla by, nebude. Děkuji, Oksana. Děkuji. Děkuji. Thank you very much. Please be careful. Thanks for your contribution and also with a tone of um, personal sort of view, strong viewpoints about what was discussed this morning. I love the fact that a teacher can be a critical thinker and inspire the kids uh, to think critically. Uh, but before we open the floor for, few, for a few questions and remarks, I would like then to go back to Professor Judith and ask you, based on what we have heard so far, the experiences from the Czech Republic, from Poland, What insights can we draw from uh, your unique experience in Switzerland to again to enrich this conversation about language acquisition for refugee learners? I think what was just mentioned now, the feeling torn of are we going to stay here or are we going back, that's something that we've experienced also not only with uh, refugees from Ukraine but also with immigrants from other countries. And I think there it's important to um, establish a pro We have a, a program in Switzerland called Heritage, Language and Culture. 
uh, where uh, children are taught in their, in their first language and they learn about the culture of their country because we believe it's important, it's the <clears throat> language in which you learn. And the other thing I think is uh, the importance of mentoring, especially for older <clears throat> children. Uh, we have also with the NGO, with the foundation in Switzerland, a program called Future Kids where students from our university actually do mentoring uh, for uh, children with migrant background, help them to get around all these things, not only language, but uh, uh, how to get around the country, how to get around the education system. And <clears throat> we accept it as part of their training. So it's a win-win situation. So maybe that's one thing that could be useful. Wonderful, thank you so much. Now, I would like to invite the audience to ask questions to the panelists or to make a comment. And I'm particularly keen to hear from countries that have been um, less discussed this morning. So if anybody from the audience would like to ask a question or make a comment, please grab the microphone. And if you can be brief within a minute, it really help so that we can hear from more participants. And for the, for the, in, in the interest of translation, we'll, go, we'll take one question at a time. I know it's not ideal, but we'll, we'll do like that. And please introduce yourself and the country where you're based. Sure, good afternoon. I'm Matthias Lansart from UNICEF, Romania. Um, and thank you very much to the panelists. I think We've learned a great deal on language acquisition for integration in host countries uh, over the past two years. I'm still stuck looking at the figures with uh, the fact that we, even though we've made a lot of progress, we still have about half of all refugee children who have really integrated into national education systems. And also stuck with some of the feedback I got from parents um, themselves, and I think which are useful to be reminded, which, um, which told me at some point, look, of course, you would like us to integrate into the national system, but, and we appreciate that, but remember that we've lost everything, and that you're asking us, in a way, to get, to give, to get rid of what the only thing we've, we're left with in terms of dignity, which is our culture and language when you're asking us to integrate international education system. We, we, I think we all understand um, um, what's around it. I just wonder, um, um, I think the panelists from Switzerland um, talked about what was uh, the heritage learning and what was, how it was embedded into, um, into the program for uh, um, hosting refugee children whether there has been some sort of thinking in Czech Republic and in Poland as well around this issue of making space for language acquisition but in Ukrainian language um, as well, parallelly, because I think that's part of the equation which will help us move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias, uh, bringing the contribution from Romania, also a country with a sizable uh, refugee uh, population. Any reflection from either the Czech Republic or Poland in terms of the question that Matthias has raised? Yes, of course, that's very, uh, let's say, sensitive subject. And um, I think that uh, as a few minutes ago, Oksana told us about this targeted programs. And um, what, what we do is we try to not impose an, anything, yeah? And we don't, like, uh, with our activities, and I'm pretty, sh I'm pretty sure that with all uh, the panelists and, and countries, we don't want to, like, replace Ukrainian language culture by Czech, Polish, or Swiss. We want to enable a better well-being in the country, in, in our country, just for those weeks, months, or 
years. Thank you. Jestli můžu, k tomuhle jenom mě napadá jedna taková věc, kterou my třeba v, při vzdělávání pedagogů doporučujeme i využívat znalosti jazyka těch dětí ve chvíli, kdy oni neumí úplně dobře česky a používat ho i ve vzdělávacím procesu. To znamená hledat pro ně materiály, které třeba jsou v jejich rodném jazyce a které jim osvětlí nějaké téma a kde, kde, kde mohou vlastně tu, tu, te, ten svůj jazyk použít. A i v českých školách vlastně je to tak, že ta, ten jazyk není e, přímo nahrazen, ale samozřejmě čeština e, je potřebná pro integraci těch dětí. A e, e, když přijde dítě mluvící anglicky, tak se domluví se svými spolužáky, protože od třetí třídy mají angličtinu, ale když přijde dítě z jiného z jiné země, tak ta čeština je prostě pro něj důležitá pro to, aby se mohl zařadit mezi své, uh, své um, stejně staré děti. A uh, taková zkušenost je, že vlastně plno těch dětí uh, v tu chvíli, kdy se chce zařadit, se chce opravdu zařadit. Nechce speciálně uh, říkat, já jsem z té země, já jsem z oné země. Vlastně chce být součástí té školy, chce být součástí té třídy a je e, opravdu, jak říká tady kolegyně, e, takové vel, velmi jako delikátní téma, vlastně, jak zpracovat s, tou, s tím e, jejich původním, tou jejich původní zemí a sou náležitostí i s tou jejich kulturou a zároveň ale je nechat e, si zažít ten pocit, že patří do té naší společnosti. Thank you. I had hoped to open more the conversation, but of course the discussion, the sessions is about to end, but the conversation goes on and I encourage you to engage with the panelists during the breaks and as well as tomorrow. But before we wrap up, I would like to ask each panelist to share one short key takeaway or thoughts, one sentence, even one word if you want about language integration, language acquisition, second language acquisition as well. Profesor Žit, are you ready? Let's základní, some time. Základní, základní myšlenkou pro mě je, že ten jazyk by měl ty děti přivést k životní pohodě. Znalost toho jazyka. Um, okay, so um, we are strongly convinced, as <laughs> a SOC Foundation, after uh, those two years of experience of supporting teachers, uh, that only um, strong, devoted, wisely supported adults, teachers or parents can and would be able to um, raise strong, self-confident um, young people. So that's why we, we focus on teachers' training. Thank you. Thank you. I think the context is very important. Obviously, in Switzerland, in each classroom, you know, we have probably 18 different, you know, from 25 children. So they're integrating into a totally different context than they would be integrating here. And uh, I think uh, the relationship is very important. So I would be a little bit hesitant say, to say, well, you first have to learn Czech and then we will relate to you. <laughs> I think we have to find ways however, to relate, and that gives the motivation to learn the language. Thank you. So in conclusion, I would like to invite the audience to give a big round of applause to our panelists. <laughs> so let me turn over to Aki, who yep. introduced the following uh, panel discussions. Yep. Thank you very much, panel members, and Andrea, for your moderation. So without further ado, I'd like to invite another colleague of mine, uh, Tanya Dankovic, who is the Chief of Education 
also uh, research for development, adolescent development, uh, covering a lot in the uh, UNICEF Refugee Response Office in Slovakia. So thank you, Tanya. So you will cover the issues around well-being and safe welcoming school. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Aki. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, I mean, it is a, a great conference and great experience and somehow this panel is very much linked to what, what we already uh, uh, heard in the, in the first panel. Uh, we all know that many Ukrainian children, and this was discussed in the previous panel, and young people experience stressful and traumatic experiences before leaving Ukraine and throughout their migration journey. They also have a lot of challenges in adjusting to their life in, in their host countries. And we all know that longer term impact of what children and young people might have experienced before, during and after fleeing Ukraine is dependent on the psychosocial support they receive in, in, in their host country and about the feelings that they had when they needed to adjust in that new environment, uh, did uh, how the, the entire environment looked for them and the school for them is their that natural environment, in my environment with their, pe with their peers. Uh, schools play a vital role in addressing refugee learners' needs and in promoting their social and emotional learning and well-being. This is an essential component of ensuring their inclusion in education and as a, uh, in society as a whole. Today, I'm honored to have a great uh, group of speakers and education experts and professionals. Ms. Uh, Ashbieta Neroy, uh, director uh, from the Ministry of Edu Director on Inclusive Education from Ministry of Education in Poland. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Matej Sapak, uh, uh, he's uh, leader of the team of Ukraine in the Ministry of Education, Research, Development and Youth in Slovakia. Welcome, Matej. And Mr. Peter Winkler, Director of the National Institute for Mental Health in Czech Republic. In the, in the form of the discuss, welcome. In the form on, of the discussant, uh, we will have also uh, honor to hear from the experiences from Hungary, from uh, Mr. Abel Lukas Kish. He will join us also uh, today. So uh, we will try to, to answer a few key questions that are related to well-being. First of all, how uh, have refugee children have been welcomed in the education system in the host countries and communities? And are there any good practices uh, that we can learn from and that we can share in this panel? Uh, we don't have a lot of time, you know, and there are many burning and questions, and I know that people would like to, to hear from you. So we will also try to, with a few questions, and uh, to each of you, and then we will just try to repeat and to, to give shorter answers. So for Ashbieta, uh, I learned a lot uh, during our discussion about situation in Poland, so I'm really keen uh, uh, to share this, uh, this with our uh, public. Uh, can, you a little, can you tell us more how uh, Poland approached the, the integration and inclusion of refugee children? Uh, what are support measures that, uh, that, were, uh, that you provide uh, currently in schools? Uh, what is the national policy? And a little bit describe the, the situation and, and what is currently hap what happened when the, the war started and when children start to come and how the process in school looked like. Thank you for the invitation and the, it's a privilege to share with you the Polish experiences. Uh, so, um, before the uh, war in Ukraine started, uh, we had in Poland already existing measures for um, providing education and care for students uh, who came to Poland from abroad. So uh, we could say that uh, the system, let's say, uh, was ready. It wasn't ready because the, the challenge was um, the number of students we, uh, uh, who came to Poland. Uh, 
before the war we had uh, more or less 40,000 students from Ukraine, but uh, after the uh, start of the war, uh, it was uh, 180 thousands of students. So the the system wasn't ready, the teachers wasn't ready, the, the, there was a challenge to provide enough places in uh, in schools to prepare uh, staff. And of course the, the, the challenge was connected with the circumstances. Uh, uh, so the uh, students came with uh, war trauma, uh, with family, with um, uh, problems uh, with functioning, with, uh, you know, they have to live their they life, their they peers, their they schools. And of course, there was a big need to support the whole families, not only, not only students. Uh, so, uh, very quickly was uh, prepared the legislation and uh, we started to uh, provide uh, support in different areas of life, uh, uh, health care, of course, social care, uh, and started to uh, uh, to uh, provide um, uh, education for 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 whole uh, students. Uh, we were lucky because we have started to work on improving our inclusiveness and accessibility in education system uh, a few years ago. <laughs> Uh, and uh, after the war, we and after the, pan, the, the COVID pandemic, uh, we realized that it was uh, the last moment to uh, to uh, to start this work. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, how about Slovakia? What was the situation there? I know that systems were not ready. But how Slovakia approached entire situation? What were the national policy in terms of welcoming new students? And how system looked like from the perspective of schools? I know that you did a lot of peer learning with schools and that many things happened in order to, to calibrate the approach. So what was the situation there? So in Slovakia, we were not really used to large number of foreigners in the education system in the first place. Uh, a few years before the conflict, uh, we saw a gradual increase in the number of foreigners, which was roughly you know, 1,000 foreign students a year. Um, and we got to about 10,000 foreigners right before the conflict started. Obviously, with, with the war in Ukraine, uh, within a couple of months, we had 10,000 additional foreigners in the country. And that was a big shock to all the systems that were in place. Uh, at the same time, most thinking in Slovakia that deals with inclusion and integration was focused on working with the Roma children uh, who face some of, similar, some of the similar problems to the problems faced by Ukrainian refugees. Um, uh, you know, different socioeconomic background compared to the, the, the majority population, uh, problems with actually mastering the language of education and so on. So in, in some ways, this experience, though, was helpful because the schools that had a lot of experience working with Roma children were actually very well prepared to work with, with the refugee children. Schools that have never encountered a non-majority student struggled a lot more. In terms of the initial reaction, uh, we've recognized early on that language support will be necessary and so additional funding was put towards uh, language acquisition. Uh, we've rec re recognized that psychological support would be needed, so crisis support teams were established uh, in each uh, region uh, immediately to support students. Um, and uh, the National Institute of, of, uh, of uh, Education and Youth has put out materials to all schools uh, to assist teachers in integrating students from intercultural backgrounds. Uh, so the initial reaction was relatively swift and robust. Um, and yet, a year later, looking at how we've done, uh, we see that a number of problems persist. There's a large number of students for whom the language courses were too short or offered at the wrong time, and we still have a large number of, of Ukrainian children who do not have not mastered the language. Uh, we've realized that a number of the cultural inclusion programs and language support programs were too formal. 
And so although large legislative changes have introduced what we call a catalog of support measures that's supposed to, to assist in this integration, um, at many schools this is not yet happening and a lot more effort needs to be done in, in teacher training. Um, and likewise, uh, although initial efforts at cultural inclusion were made, including you know, cultural events, uh, helping students get to know each other and so on, uh, there's a large number of students who report that they've never made a friend outside of their own social group. So about 20, 25% of Ukrainian children report that they have not a single friend from the majority. So there's a lot of work that remains to be done. Uh, but you know, we'll, you'll probably hear more about that tomorrow in a panel where we'll have our state school inspector talk about it. Uh, one final point that I will make, and then we can come back to it later, is the importance of best practice sharing. There's only so much that any state institute ministry or a law can do. You know, we can send advisories or instructions to school, but what we found actually was the most powerful tool was bringing schools together uh, or you know, organizing regional panels, introducing regional coordinators who help schools come together, discuss what they've done from headmaster to headmaster, as opposed to from you know, an official uh, 500 kilometer away. And so those best practice sharing, um, uh, best practice sharing um, uh, attempt, uh, I think were, were one uh, very successful uh, piece of practice that we would recommend using in the future as well. Thank you, uh, and Petr, uh, thank you, Mate. For Petr, I mean, we all know, and now we are hearing from schools that language acquisition is something that schools and teachers matter when children are coming. They also matter of, about academic knowledge, but somehow that uh, psychosocial aspect and the mental health of children is somehow um, still not the, 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 like, the first thing that school will think of and probably because all of our countries never had experience with the war trauma and, uh, and children that they had this massive trauma that, that, they, that they experienced. What do you think, what is the role of schools? Uh, what should be a role of schools? And do you have uh, some good practice uh, from, from Czech Republic to, to share with us? Yes, well, um, the role of schools should be central in terms of mental health. Obviously, it's, it's a it's, it's a point of natural contact of uh, children with not just education system, but with the world that is outside of their families. And it does not apply only to children who came from Ukraine or from other settings. It should apply to all children. And all children should be equipped with the basic knowledge and skills, how to take care of themselves, how to understand their emotions, uh, how to achieve and maintain good mental health, how to seek help effectively uh, if necessary. But that shouldn't be applicable just to universal curriculum in mental health literacy for children. Um, it should be applicable to school as a complex organism, which is, um, uh, which, which should be um, very much um, ignored in, uh, in the community. It should be networked with all other services that are there. Uh, it should have a proper good communication about mental health, not just towards pupils, but also towards families and towards uh, teachers themselves. And, and there is a good evidence actually for that, that um, such programs that include many components, not just universal curriculum for children, um, but whole school approach and, and to a special work with those at risk, uh, such as people who came from uh, Ukraine, um, should be uh, an integral part of what uh, is present uh, in schools. Having said that, uh, this is somewhat new in uh, my country. Uh, the interest in mental health in school setting basically has not been there until the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, when we came to different bodies uh, responsible for education. They were not seeing mental health as an issue uh, that they should focus their attention to. Uh, and this has started to change gradually with the COVID-19 pandemics because teachers were calling, yeah, we have children who um, you know, have a suicide attempt or another uh, issues. So that's the time when when institutions started to be interested in the, in the topic. And, um, and that started some initiatives which are 
um, still rather haphazard than than evidence based. So um, that's that's the that's the setting. The 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 role of the school should be centered, but it's not still, and the schools are not equipped so far with uh, with um, proper tools uh, to take care effectively of mental health, and uh, the situation with with those who came from Ukraine uh, differed quite a lot, actually. Uh, because uh, some of the schools have uh, good programs and, and they are very much interested in the topic. Uh, other schools, for them, it's still heavily stigmatized. Uh, they, if, you, if you speak about mental health, they, um, you see the reaction which is, uh, which is very uh, negative to that. So, so there is still uh, there is still lots of uh, lots of things that needs to be done, and there are lots of lessons uh, learned. But what we miss, I think, is a strong leadership to make the evidence based into practice. Yeah, I think that we have to 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 create all this evidence and uh, about the successful examples. So, I'm, I I will ask uh, more about these uh, specific uh, practices that you are developing in your country that can be also inspiration for other countries. I want to go back to uh, Ashbeta because what you mentioned it is that uh, your inclusive education reforms were timely. Uh, and what we want to make sure it is that uh, inclusive education also works for refugee children. These are, and we know all that as a teacher you have a diverse, all kids they have a diverse needs and we have to find a way how we actually write the right set of support measures that are relevant for each particular child, child in the classroom. So, and to empower teachers to do that in the classroom is a very specific challenge. How you do that in, in Poland? Yeah, yes, agree with the, the big lesson learned uh, uh, in Poland that uh, when you have a more accessible and more inclusive system, so you have system better uh, prepared for the diversity for such a uh, situation we suffered, like the pandemic or like uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, really, the empowering schools, empowering teachers, this is one of our strategy we are working on, I, I think, since 2017. Uh, so we started a close cooperation with higher uh, education institutions, with uh, universities to uh, to have the the evidence based policy as you said it's it's very important so we invited them to work with us on you know to to uh, to make a research on the practice best practice or practice uh, which works in special context and why it works why it doesn't work and we invited universities to organized for us, free of church, uh, for part participants, postgraduate studies in the field of inclusive education. And uh, there were two uh, editions of those studies. We started with four topics, early intervention and supporting development of, uh, uh, of uh, children and supporting families the, in the same time, working with diverse classrooms supporting children who suffer uh, problems with communication, any kinds, not only you know, linguistic, uh, but developmental as well, or neurodevelopmental. Uh, and the fourth topic, fourth topic was uh, counseling for, for families, because we would like to make a shift from the medical approach to biopsychosocial model of understanding functioning of, of every person, of a child, of um, uh, of uh, a learner. Uh, next year, we added two, uh, two, uh, two topics, so um, preparation for psychologists in education systems, so to be better prepared how to support children, how to support other teachers, how to work with parents, but uh, specifically in education context. Uh, and uh, another topic was uh, um, studies, postgraduate studies for special pedagogues, because uh, in 2022 we established, we make a big 
in my opinion, but not only mine, <laughs> Uh, me, uh, we uh, established a new law. So uh, in law, we stated that every mainstream setting, preschool and school, um, uh, have to uh, employ uh, specialist teachers. It was possibility before, but now it started to be an obligation. And thanks to this change, because we provided um, funding from state budget as well, following this the, the, this law. And uh, since uh, 2021 until now, there is uh, uh, the numbers of um, posts of uh, specialist teachers increased uh, from uh, 22,000 uh, to uh, 47,000 of specialist teachers. So we have them in mainstream schools. But another step was very important to prepare them to work in diverse uh, uh, environment and in, in this time we were looking how to do it, how to prepare the staff already employed or being employed in, in the next future. Uh, then UNICEF appeared <laughs> and asked us, do you need any help? How we can uh, support you with providing um, education and and care and psychological and pedagogical support for Ukrainian uh, uh, learners. We said, yes, please help us. <laughs> and we uh, developed together uh, a very innovative, in our country, training program uh, for specialist teachers, accessible schools for all. Uh, and But it's not only dedicated how to work with Ukrainian learners, because uh, our approach is to make the every school more accessible for all learners, including those who are refugees from Ukraine or from, from other countries. Of course, there's a special situation and the, 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 the big focus is uh, on uh, Ukrainian children because they need more support now. But in the same time, you know, the, the whole communities, when we are to, uh, thinking about inclusion, that we have to affect the whole system, the whole school, the, uh, every teacher, every parent, and every learner. Uh, so we would like to uh, address uh, our, our activity to, uh, to, to uh, to be pre to, to schools to be better prepared for uh, working with, with with diverse needs. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ashbieta. I wanted to ask Marty, what are your plans now in Slovakia? What are the next steps to make schools uh, more open, more supportive for for students from diverse background, in, and how to help better students from Ukraine? To, to be included and to feel well mm -hmm. in schools? I think there's sort of three, three areas here. Um, one is the sort of legal and legislation and ministry approach. Uh, as I've briefly mentioned, this is this introduction of the catalog of support measures, uh, which is an attempt to shift from a completely independent state-run approach to inclusion and, and diversification of curriculum. Uh, some of you may know in Slovakia we have you know, the schools, but most of the psychological and pedagogical support was historically provided by external centers for psychological uh, support. Um, and in the school there was typically uh, a school psychologist present, but he was only dealing, or he or she was only dealing with the sort of least serious cases, everything else was you know, referred outside, diagnosed outside, and then you know, a, sort of a support plan was provided to the school. Now that uh, approach, um, as, as we now know, is fairly impractical. Uh, more and more we recognize the need is for support teams who are present directly in the school, for trained pedag you know, teachers who are trained in pedagogy, special pedagogy, who understand the needs of you know, the majority of, of students that they meet, uh, and only the most complicated, severe uh, cases should be dealt with externally. And so that shift is currently happening um, in Slovakia. The, this catalog of support measures being created to provide headmasters and teachers with sort of a, a, a manual, or you know, we, we like to think about it as sort of a set of Lego pieces that they can use to build the 
inclusive, diverse education that each student needs. Um, and that's accompanied also with trainings for school psychologists, support personnel, uh, teacher assistants and teachers themselves in how to use these various, various tools that schools should have available and schools should use uh, in, in dealing with you know, any, any um, inclusion or, or, or diversity uh, situations in, in schools. So that's the, you know, the, the, the legal uh, approach. The second part of this, I think, is recognizing that when we talk especially about, about you know, refugee children, uh, children from uh, different cultures uh, and so on, is sort of a mindset shift towards prevention and positive psychology. Again, historically, the approach of you know, most schools and most, most uh, you know, support system in Slovakia is one of either resilience building uh, in case of bullying or other problems, or, or you know, managing the response and, and uh, the, you know, the already bad situation. You know, how do, do you do once you've encountered bullying in school? Who do you report it to? How do you respond to bullying and so on? Um, what's critical, uh, but you know, so far much less present in schools, is thinking about how do you create an environment in which bullying doesn't become a problem in the first place? How do you encourage things like friendship in school? How do you encourage kindness? How do you encourage the positive elements of, of a school culture that make you know, problems like bullying um, uh, less of a problem in the first place, and then you have to spend a lot less time actually trying to remedy the problem once it's there. That doesn't say we shouldn't deal with bullying or look for bullying or you know, address it once we see it, uh, but that point is already almost too late. Uh, you know, a lot of the damage has already been done. As we all know, a number of cases go unreported, especially in cases of refugee populations. Uh, and so trying to address uh, the situation after it's happened is, is already too late. So shifting to a whole school understanding of what are actually the causes of bullying, how do we prevent it, is another critical element of, of what we need to do. Uh, talking about emotions in the first place is critical. There's a very interesting tool called the emotional compass that's being used in, in Slovakia. Uh, although we haven't rolled it out to all schools yet right now, it's, it's you know, being, being provided by uh, by NGO partners, uh, but the idea that we actually need to talk about emotions in school and that part of our work as teachers is not just teaching math or geography or whatever it is, but it's actually helping children understand their emotional needs, their emotional states, and, 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 and get, get a vocabulary for talking about it is another critical part of, of what we need to do, I believe, uh, to, to help the children. Thank you, Mate. And now to, to better... Uh, and. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, prevention is a, is a, a solution. So uh, when we discussed about this, uh, this um, panel, you were talking about uh, evidence-based model that you actually developed, you implemented here in, in Czech Republic, and it proved uh, effective in terms of uh, supporting trauma-informed learning in schools. Can you tell us a little bit more? What, what exactly is the, 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 the project, what was the approach, and what is your experience? Yes, obviously, mm -hmm. thank you. But uh, first of all, uh, I cannot agree more with Maciej. So um, we need to perceive all these programs as um, what Maciej um, said is a, is a piece of Lego, yeah. which uh, is good, uh, but it's not as effective as if you have the whole thing, actually. And ideally, we would provide the schools with the whole thing, so they see the f whole picture, and then we would start with bits and pieces and up and putting all the fragments together, which obviously is something that uh, authorities can do, such as Ministry of Youth Education and Sport. Uh, they need to encourage this kind of approach. And there is very limited um, space what we can do as a National Institute of Mental Health. Um, so as a National Institute of Mental Health, we can just come up with those fragments, with those bits and pieces. And I mentioned the universal curriculum in mental health literacy for children as a, as a, as a program that is very successful and, and effective and uh, that builds on what is written in curricula for, for children so it's not an extra curricular activity, etc., etc. For uh, those who came from Ukraine, we. Uh, developed a program that works primarily 
with uh, teachers and parents. Uh, with teachers, because it's unrealistic to expect that if we delivered, if we developed a program that would be delivered, let's say, by psychologists, then it would be unrealistic to expect that it would be scalable to, um, you know, schools that are especially at the periphery of, of country. So we knew that we need to work with, uh, with teachers uh, as, a, as, a, as those who, when equipped properly with knowledge and skills and competencies, they would be able to deliver such a program uh, to children, which, which we did, actually. Um, uh, the experiences that, that we got um, were, and we developed a program for parents as well. So these were just brief, brief programs for one, two days, building on our previous previous experiences with, with uh, creating much larger programs uh, in terms of universal curricula for, for children. And um, the experiences that we did uh, with, with this one, and that was supported by UNICEF, by the way, um, it was very well received by all of them, by teachers, parents, children. Um, we have a very good feedback and now a good evidence that uh, it's effective in terms of process and outcomes as well. Um, and uh, it was very well accepted by children as well. And it reduced the uh, occurrence of these negative um, uh, phenomena, as much I mentioned, bullying or, or others. But having said that, um, what we encountered as a challenge was that um, in many cases, basic needs of uh, children were not met. And then to come up with something like mental health um, education um, in situations where when children didn't know how to get to the bathroom, um, it was uh, perceived as something that you know we should first address the more basic needs and then come to mental health well-being. So that was that was the first thing, and obviously that that varied across the schools because some schools are excellent and all the basic needs were covered, and in that setting the the program was. Um, uh, much better uh, in terms of acceptance and in terms of effectivity. Uh, but the second thing which was really important, and that refers to the programs for parents, and, um, and it's not just from the program that we delivered within the school setting, but also from other programs that we uh, developed for the refugee population, uh, was that um, the group sessions for Ukrainian parents were um, perceived as something that is of a great benefit because it facilitated some kind of self-help within the community. So that put together uh, parents who faced the similar problems with their children and they were wondering, or oh, are we alone? Are we somehow special? Uh, does this happen to other families as well? What shall we do about it? And when you put them together and they share these experiences, they find out they are not alone. Uh, they find out what coping strategies are used by other members of the community and, and they are much more able to share the resources effectively. Thank you so much. I think that uh, all peer support and, and, uh, and the group uh, efforts are very important and they also in Slovakia were very used and, and I think that they were very effective. Uh, I would like to invite, before we go for questions, hold yourself a few more minutes. Uh, we have a very uh, inspiring uh, good practice to share as a practice come from Hungary. And Mr. Kish will tell us more about School for Success program that was implemented in Hungary. Uh, and please tell us more what was the program and how it helped Ukrainian children to be successful in schools. Thank you and greetings to everybody. My name is Abel Kish. I come from Hungary. Dorcas is a Christian aid organization. More than three decades uh, we have been uh, serving the poor. We also have an office in Budapest, but we are based in Debrecen very close to the Transcarpathian uh, Ukrainian uh, border. And uh, we have a five and a half uh, acre uh, Christian campsite for uh, children that we uh, opened up for the refugees. So today we are over the 150,000 nights spent by the refugees uh, at the uh, campsite. So uh, we joke around with the 
uh, staff that we used to have uh, 30 Roma kids uh, staying for one week. Now we have 250 uh, refugees uh, not going home. It's uh, like a 24-hour uh, camp. And uh, we wanted to uh, welcome those, uh, the lower segments of the society, so the poorest of the poor. So we naturally attracted uh, those people who have uh, the, the deep poverty uh, symptoms. And that meant the Roma community uh, from the Transcarpathian uh, territory uh, that is uh, 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 very close to, to Hungary. And uh, the, the good part of this is uh, that they speak Hungarian, so we can uh, communicate uh, uh, with them. Uh, the challenge, which makes it a double challenge now that they are Ukrainian refugees, is that they uh, Roma communities uh, coming uh, to stay uh, with us in Hungary. And uh, uh, we, we were hoping, you know, that three weeks and the war is over. But uh, then we found out uh, that uh, it is a, a long-term uh, situation. So uh, we uh, somehow had to come up with uh, uh, different uh, tactics to help uh, the families also to integrate. Uh, and, you know, the Hungarian government is pushing uh, start a job, go to school uh, to all the families. And it is a double challenge when uh, you are a, refu uh, a Ukrainian refugee and with a Roma background uh, that, uh, that comes uh, with its uh, own uh, challenges. So we started with a basic need program with uh, social workers, uh, also um, with uh, healthcare workers, helping the families to orientate in the local community, uh, find jobs, but also we uh, help uh, them uh, with different uh, uh, mental health uh, programs and psychosocial support, uh, marriage counseling, child rearing, um, life skills, and all these uh, sort of uh, things. And then the summer of 2022 came when we realized that we have 100 kids uh, running around having fun, but they should be in school. And that's when uh, the UNICEF came to Debrecen Municipality. We are in very close uh, partnership uh, with the chari local charity board as well. And we uh, uh, established a program called S School to Success. And uh, the vision between behind this uh, program was uh, that uh, we saw the gap, you know, if you just push them to school, it will be a disaster. So let's uh, 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 bridge this gap with the school to success program. So when they get to school, it will be a successful uh, experience for them. And uh, we have uh, five classrooms, five teachers, uh, uh, psychologists, and also kindergarten uh, teachers uh, helping uh, the kids and the parents also uh, with all sorts of things, uh, reading and writing. You know, these Roma communities, basically also the adults don't read and write. Uh, and uh, education uh, at a value level is not uh, so high. So, you know, uh, boys start to work at the age of 16, uh, girls start to become mothers at the age of uh, 14. So. Um, uh, we work also with the families that is, you know, it's important to go to school and we also work with the local communities, the host communities. Every ch children is in enrolled, uh, but some of them, uh, about 50% of them go to school to go to the school to success at the campsite where we have the local classrooms and the others are taken to the schools uh, by bus. And we also have a mobile team, thanks to uh, UNICEF, uh, which is working with the teachers, the parents, uh, the, the headmasters, uh, uh, sorting out issues if there are, and there are uh, issues uh, in connection with this uh, process. So that's where we are at this stage. Thank you, Abel. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, I hope that that, uh, that the project will continue and that the children will go to, to schools in Hungary. I wanted to, uh, to give you a chance to ask our panelists uh, uh, questions. They were, I know that there are a lot of questions and we will have a chance to, to talk to, to panelists during the reception today. But if you would like to ask, please. Ah, Olena, this is our colleague Olena from Ukraine, from UNICEF Ukraine. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Olena. I'm the Education in Emergency Officer 
uh, in Ukrainian office. Uh, so I'm from Kiev, and this is, by the way, the sign of Kiev. Yeah? <laughs> because in Prague, we told me, okay, it resembles something different. <laughs> Yeah, so, and I have another question, but probably more like experience sharing, yeah, if if I may just step in. Yeah, in Ukraine, as UNICEF, uh, we are dealing with uh, a lot of people, and in education system also, yeah, suffering from mental health issues and who really uh, need the psychosocial support. And uh, I would like to mention that, uh, well, to support your opinion here also, yes, that the most effective ways to support people, uh, because we work with teachers also, yeah, they suffer the same uh, everyday danger as the kids <coughs> in Ukraine, and also sometimes they are the only breadwinner in the household because their husbands are in the army. So because 85, now 88% of teachers in Ukraine are female. Uh, so that's why that's a lot of work. Yeah, and a lot of organizations, not only UNICEF, but also other sister agencies and other organizations to work with that. Uh, but the best practices are really in this group work. So uh, I share my experience from uh, the colleague who is working with uh, early childhood education. And uh, you know, uh, probably, yes, yeah, so this is a very famous person in Romania, by the way, because she started the school there when she was a refugee. So Anastasia shared the example uh, when uh, the, our partner worked with uh, parents. So, and that was really effective. Yeah, well, because the parents in kin uh, for kids in preschool, uh, so they had a lot of problems and, uh, well, they need to, to say something to a child who is afraid of uh, the sounds, who is afraid of the air alarms. So that's why working with these parents on the basis of kindergartens helped a lot. Yeah? So it was like groups and working with groups of parents. And also one more interesting experience that was uh, sport for develop development. So that was the um, organization who worked on the level of uh, municipality. In Ukraine, we call them gramadas. Uh, and we have a lot of them, yeah. So, and uh, that was really effective uh, because like all kids in municipality, they were involved, not only in one school, but also they had the sport activities in summer. And that played also very well with inclusion because the kids with special needs were involved there. So these are the two practices that I would like to, to highlight and uh, to support your opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you, Alena. Uh, thank you so much. I wanted for the closure, I mean, we heard a lot about the, the, roles, uh, the role of schools, importance of whole school approach, uh, importance of supporting diverse needs uh, of students, uh, supporting teachers to do their role, supporting schools to reach out and to do the, the, the all uh, that they can do in the contact with children. Um, I wanted to ask you from, as a, for a closure, for, two words that you would like us, all of us here, to do more uh, in terms of improving well-being in schools. Two things, simple things. Okay. Uh, for me, I will choose. Yeah? <laughs> I will choose the future is in cross-sectoral cooperation and uh, synergy, so cooperation between different levels between uh, central level, local governments, uh, civil uh, society, uh, NGOs. So uh, this is the only way to provide the, the, the whole range of different needs of learners and the, their families and uh, the school environment. And um, the second is to invest in resources, so use wisely better resources, and we are working on it, so uh, every everyone, every institution counts, special sector, because we, we are working on uh, giving them the new role of supporting centers, resource centers for inclusive education, and we are developing resources for teachers, specialists, for schools, like tools for assessment of needs and planning the support, and as far as uh, the mental health is concerned, 
We are working all together in cooperation with different sectors in four fields. So the promotion on mental health, the prevention, <laughs> the support in crisis, and then the support to, uh, you know, uh, after the trauma. So to to come back to to, to the well-being. Thank you, Mate. This is really true of, of any change, but you know, if we want teachers, um, or, you know, um, more broadly, uh, people who work in schools and who work with refugees to be effective agents of change, we often focus on the skills we need to give them, you know, the training, the resources, um, but there's one key prerequisite to all of this, and that's a very simple belief that change is possible in the first place. And this is something that, for all sorts of reasons, many teachers have lost, uh, especially if, you know, like in Slovakia, the average age of a teacher is, you know, nearing 50 or exceeding 50 years old. Um, and so just being able to show that change is possible is a critical element of, you know, everything that follows. Uh, this is where I think you know the practice sharing that we did with with UNICEF and and, and, and in other ways is a critical element, uh, and we need to find more time, and unfortunately that means more resources to make that best practice sharing possible, uh, because everything starts with the belief. I have to see another teacher manage a classroom with three kids with special needs, two refugees, and you know seven other different things that I need to manage before I believe that the training I'm being given is actually of any practical use. So, you know, seeing is believing, experience is believing, helping people believe that change is possible is, is really necessary. Thank you. Peter? So first, complex approach, uh, not to focus only on children, but on the whole institution and uh, keeping in mind that it's an organism which is very complex. So we need a complex approach. Um, and that means also uh, supporting teachers and other uh, people who are employed within the school system with their own mental health, which is something that we very often miss. We just assume that they will be able to uh, take care of their own mental health on themselves and they, they're gonna be good. Whereas in practice, we often see teachers who are close to burnout, who don't have any understanding to mental health, for whom it's uh, very difficult uh, just to keep up, who self-medicate themselves with alcohol, etc., etc., etc. And then we are ending up in that situation, which is similar to the joke when uh, you know guy in his 50s uh, says to his 18-year son, um, son, we need to talk about sex. And, and the son says, yes, daddy, what do you need to know? <laughs> so so this, is, this is what we very often see. So complex approach is, is, uh, is very much um, uh, necessary. And second, evidence-based approach. And this is also what we, what we miss quite a lot. Uh, you know, we base our programs on uh, perception, nepotism, and, and these kind of like tradition, etc. And I myself experience programs which are hugely ineffective in terms of uh, drug prevention, for instance. You know, we had a guy in, a, in our class uh, who came and, and, and said to us like, that marijuana is um, of the same danger as heroin. And in that very second, everything was discredited. Um, so, and, and that happens every now and then, that we create a space for uh, very useful uh, things, but this space is filled with something which is not just ineffective, but also harmful sometimes. So I obviously argue very much for evidence-based approach. Thank you very much. On this uh, note, uh, I hope that this is also for us in UNICEF. Uh, um, another homework that we continue to share good practices, uh, evidence-based practices that we, uh, that we demonstrate and show that change is possible, that change is possible for children that, uh, that came from Ukraine. And thank you again, the, the Czech Republic and our panelists for making time and space to share these good practices and, uh, and inspiring uh, models. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. I have a few uh, housekeeping announcements, but uh, we have come to an end of day one, halfway through. How do you feel? You're still smiling, good. Okay, excellent. So I have a pleasure to invite our dear counterpart for us in the Czech Republic, Martina Betyakova, who is our Deputy State Secretary of the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports in the Czech Republic, for her to give us a few remarks before we finish. So Martina, for it's yours. Thank you. Tak, dobrý večer, dámy a pánové. Uh, můj velký obdiv, že je vás stále tady ještě tolik. Uh, počkám, až budete mít sluchátka, protože já budu mluvit česky. Uh, budu mluvit česky, protože se stydím mluvit anglicky, přestože po té, co jsme začali spolupracovat s UNICEFem, tak jsem se začala učit anglicky. Rok mám lektorku a každé ráno, ne každé ráno, každou středu ráno v sedm mě trápí a přesto se stydím. A o to víc obdivuju to, co tady předvedli ti mladí lidé v tom bloku, kdy mluvili o svých zkušenostech a mluvili neuvěřitelnou češtinou. Tak to mi vzalo úplně veškeré ambice, veškeré ambice mluvit česky. Na druhou stranu, tak jsem si říkala, kdy nejvíc padají ty jazykové bariéry, jestli tak vás napadá. Určitě to bude u sklenky dobrého vína v Čechách, piva, čímž malinko přemostňuji k tomu, co nás čeká za chvilku, ale taky když máte někoho rád, když se zamilujete, tak pak prostě mluvíte a je to vztah a důvěra, který vám dává tu odvahu. A možná, když jsme měli ten, dneska ten blok k jazykové podpoře a rozvoji dětí, tak neříkám, že by byl, kdyby se všichni tady zamilovali a našli si přítele a kamarády, že by byla zbytečná jazyková podpora, to určitě ne. Ale ukazuje to právě na to, jak moc jsou vztahy důležité. Nejenom proto, abych se cítil dobře, ale proto, abych měl odvahu zvednout se a jít dál, pokaždý, když je to těžké, zkusit něco nového. Myslím, že všechny evropské země jsme stáli fakticky před tím samým. Někdo měl větší zkušenost s integrací ukrajinských cizinců, uprchlíků, někdo menší, my jsme patřili k těm méně zkušeným zemím. Ale viděli jsme na začátku v těch datech, zasáhlo nás to všechny. Všichni jsme stáli před podobnými výzmami, nedostatečnými kapacitami, problémy, jak tak velké množství, tak rychle posílit v jazykových kompetencích, jak posílit a podpořit pedagogy, aby zvládli, kde se hnat finance, kde se hnat personální kapacity, aby jsme toto všechno mohli zvládnout. Těm výzvám jsme čelili prostě všichni společně. A troufnu si říct, že všichni společně jsme měli před očima konkrétní děti a jejich individuální rozvoj jejich vzdělávání, jejich spokojenost, jejich další cestu životem. A to je vlastně ten princip inkluzivního vzdělávání, tak jak o něm i dneska byla řeč. Každé konkrétní dítě, aby dostalo to, co potřebuje, aby mohlo prožívat dětství, vzdělávat se a růst. Já to, ano, řeknu to takhle. My jsme se naučili strašně moc, myslím si, ve všech evropských zemích, ale u nás v České republice opravdu hodně. Byla to obrovská škola pro nás, pro ministerstvo školství. Byla to škola pro státní zprávu obecně. Jsou tady kolegové z neziskovek, jak moc jsme se naučili spolupracovat, sednout si, zahodit bariéry, přemýšlet společně, hledat řešení a hledat je rychle, okamžitě na začátku v rámci týdnu. To bylo to, co nám dlouho nešlo a i to, co jsme se díky UNICEFu a kolegům, kteří nás s tím procesem provázeli, naučili. Obrovská škola to byla pro naše školy. Obzvlášť naše v České republice nebyly zvyklé na práci s velkým množstvím cizinců. Ani obecně práce inkluzivní vzdělávání u nás je, nechci říct nové, ale i to byla velká výzva. 
A to, jak se naučili naše školy, naši učitelé přijmout ukrajinské děti, pracovat s nima, tak tím se obohatili oni sami a tím lépe budou vzdělávat všechny další děti, které do těch škol přijdou. A samozřejmě strašně moc se naučili i všechny naše české děti. Přijali spolužáky, museli ty sociální dovednosti a kompetence, které se tak těžko učí a tak těžko se dávají do učebnic, tak se s nimi setkávali každý den. Vlastně my, my jsme si to svoje už na tom, jako Česká republika a jako společnost vzali. My jsme bohatší, ta zkušenost nás posílila a připravila nás na další výzvy. To, co je před námi a to, co nás čeká i ten zítřejší den, je naplnit, jak naplnit ten obraz inkluzivního vzdělávání, který jsme si dneska představili, jak skutečně podpořit každé dítě a zároveň i to, jak pomoci, aby tím obohaceným jsme nebyli pouze my, ale aby i Ukrajina byla opět jako silnou, krásnou a bohatou zemí. To je vlastně, to je teď ten náš úkol, před kterým stojíme, pokud nám se podaří neudělat všechno pro to, aby ukrajinské děti uměly perfektně česky a byly tady silnou podporou našeho pracovního trhu, ale aby vyrostly a byly připraveni pomoci své zemi při obnově Ukrajiny. Tak pro mě je to těžké, je to, žijeme s tím tématem dva roky, takže je to pro mě i dojemná situace. Jsem moc ráda, my vlastně... No, Končíme první den a vidíte. <laughs> Ale už dneska, protože skutečně máme za sebou obrovský kus práce s UNICEFem. A uh, věřím, že, že skutečně to je, že to je vidět. Že to je vidět v našich školách, v ukrajinské komunitě, v naší společnosti. A že společně zítra uh, naplánujeme i ta, ty další kroky, které jsou před námi. Tak teď už vám popřeji jenom pěkné zažití těch myšlenek, které jste si dneska odsud odnesli a díky kolegům z UNICEFu si vás dovolím pozvat na decepci, která je připravená pro vás dole a mezi 6. a 8. hodinou ten prostor je náš a můžeme dál společně pokračovat v neformální diskuzi. Děkuji.